over there on the right would be the uh, the gantry. If you look on page 25, you can see what this pad looks like. It's on page 25, what it looks like. The gantry would be back there. You see over here on the right, there used to be uh, tracks. See where the tracks are right here? And on the left over here, there used to be tracks. And that great big giant gantry right there, one right here. See that gantry right there? It would be moved up by track. Be pulled up. And, and they would put the rocket together back there. They would move it up and center on the pad over here. That's how they did it. And it was not easy. Now we're getting off the bus here. And I think Mark was either an engineer or a technician who worked out here. It's bright out here, isn't it? It's great. I put on my sunglasses. Yeah, I can't handle that light. Would you like to see the plaque that Bruce Willis put up in the movie Armageddon? Did y'all see that movie? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right over there. Uh, it was about a two second, uh, in, in the movie, it was about a two second display of it. Did, y did you remember that? I don't know, don't ask me names, I'm no good, but... <laughs> Why? He typed because no one's supposed to deface this. And oh. so, yeah, he had no idea Bruce did that. And he was trying to find out. He was going to bust it back. And then uh, when he found out Bruce did it, then he was okay. <laughs> <laughs> they lifted up. So the rock is set right on there, right? No, I think that's the name of the company, isn't it? Yeah. Clipper? Green, green, Clipper? Uh, folks, there's three ways you can get under this pad, to the best of my knowledge. One way is right over there, there's a, there's a cable tray that goes under the pad, zigzags, and comes over here. There's another one over where that orange uh, thing is over there, and there's some stairs right over there that go down. There's rooms under the pad, in case you didn't know that. And uh, uh, for a long time they had abandoned, they left the door open, and rattlesnakes got in there. We had to clean them up, we had to get rid of the three alligators that under here. And then later on, a 15-footer alligator went over there a few years ago, they got rid of it. But folks, uh, there are rooms under this pad, and the, the technicians and the engineers use those rooms. I don't know how thick this is exactly. It seems to me like it was two or three feet thick, but very thick, compared to some of the other places. But uh, the umbilical tower was over here, 240 feet high, and over there was a 310-foot uh, gantry, and the, and the, the Saturn 1B rocket was right up here uh, on top of this here pad right here, folks, and with, there were only seven launches on this pad. The last launch in this pad, the best of my knowledge, was Apollo 7. It would have been uh, Jim, uh, Wallace Raw, Don Eyes, Walter Cunningham. Were Cunningham was one of them. Cunningham was one. It's over there. Yeah, Walter Cunningham, Wallace Raw, and Don Eyes. Yeah. And that was the last one. Now, over there, where it's at, I want to come. By the way, for your information, John F. Kennedy was in that blockhouse with Vice President Johnson, Alan Shepard, and Debus, and uh, McNamara, a bunch of famous people. And you can see that on your home computer if you put up blockhouse. 34, John F. Kennedy, get the picture, you'll see it. And he was also over there on Block S37. Now that was the Saturn 1 pad over there. This was the Saturn 1B. And I think they even lost some Saturn 1s from here too, I believe. But folks, this is where Gus Gis Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee died in the Apollo 1 fire. And uh, on that particular day, uh, they got here about, I think it was 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I believe it was. And they went up to level A8 where the hatch was, they went inside. Uh, they were done the plugs out test, which was a, a dry run of the launch without any any fuel on board, just a just a dry run. And then Gus uh, kind of blew his top because there was a lot of talking going on between ships, and buildings, and things. And he said, "How in the world can we uh, 
uh, get to the moon and talk to the moon if we can't talk between buildings right here. So they got that little problem resolved. And then they had another problem at just about uh, 6 o'clock that evening. Uh, and that was just before the fire. I think uh, they had a problem with, uh, what was that other problem they had? Uh, oh, uh, said communications. Well, I'll have to think of it a little bit. There was another problem they had, and they got that resolved too. And then at 6.30 and one minute afterwards, in about one second, there was a power surge, there was an explosion, and they died. They were dead in 17 seconds. There's a wire where he's moving his seat, and the wire touched off the I think I think that's the whole thing, because what happened was, uh, Gus was on the left-hand side, Ed White was in the middle, Roger Chape was on the right, Ro Roger was on the radio, uh, Ed was a strong guy, the hatch was above him, you have to crank it 90 seconds, 90 times to close the thing, and Gus was the commander, and over here was a drawer, you open it, and it, it exposes the environment control unit, and it scrapes the wiring underneath it, and they think that the wire was scraped right down where you're talking about, to the very middle. And it bumped a, a little elbow where the glyco was, and loosened it, and, and the vapors from that is explosive. And uh, they think that might have happened too. When that power surge took place, that spark occurred, set off the water glycol, the water glycol set off the, um, the pure oxygen inside there and became a towering inferno inside. inside. They were trying to get out. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the way it first started, Roger was on the radio and he took a hold of the radio and says, I smell smoke, something very common. And then Ed White grabbed it real fast, fired a cockpit. And then uh, uh, within 17 seconds they were gone. There was a guy by the name of Steve, and I can't think of his last name, from North Carolina. He was here. And he was trying to help them get out with some guys, crew members, and they were trying to crank that when they died. And what happened was uh, they burned their hoses in half and they breathed in the toxic fumes, and the toxic fumes killed them. Now they had burns, but not real bad. They would have they lived, I think. But they left them in their seats for a long time, folks. And here's what happened, too Wally, Don Isley, Walter Cunningham had left an hour early. Everything was going fine. So they jumped into the T-38 jets, or taxi cabs, they, they flew back to Texas. When they landed there, there was a guy by the name of Bud Ream on the, on the ramp. And while he said to him, he said, man, what is Bud doing here? He's a NASA guy, what is he doing here on the ramp? And he knew something was wrong. And he got down from his, his plane and he walked over to Bud and Bud says, gentlemen, we have a problem. And so he explained what happened. On that day, Wally was ticked off. Wally said to himself, he privately, I'm never going to launch after this ever again. I don't trust the engineers anymore. And so anyhow, that's why one reason he never launched again. When he was up there, if you remember, he had a head cold, and they told him to put his helmet back on because he was sneezing. He said, no way. And so Chris says, if you don't put that helmet back on, you're never going to forget. Well, he said, I don't care anyway. So I left the helmet off. Well, let's go, folks. Fat let's go. Fat quick. Fat quick. Fat quick. Fat, fat quick. Fat quick. Fat quick. Fat quick. Fat quick. Fat quick.